Hello, everyone. Just a bit of a postscript, though. We're posting it at the beginning of the episode because it was after our taping that we had the convulsive event of the attempted assassination of Trump at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. Actually, uh, my old stomping grounds as U.S. attorney and by a shooter who appears to actually be from Pittsburgh, a kind of bedroom community there. So Susan has very kindly agreed to come back and just talk about it a bit. I want to start by stipulating there are more immediate and grave matters than what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. There is Trump's well-being. There's the figuring out how the shooter could have had a line of sight shot. There's determining if he's an actual lone wolf. There's what happens going forward. There is all the way in which this may be symptomatic of our politics now and be beyond the reach of law enforcement. All of that, all of that more important, but it just would be somewhat anomalous to launch into the discussion that you're about to hear with Susan, Jason, and Mike Podhorzer without uh, having the gloss of the Trump shooting and how it plays into the general subject matter that we focus on in the episode. So, Susan, thanks very much for returning. I'm grateful to be with you. Uh, there is obviously a lot to discuss. Yeah, it'll be playing out over weeks, but let's just think about the shooting first as a gloss on our discussion. How does it play into the situation for the Democrats involving Biden? Does it give Trump a sort of permanent shot in the arm? How do Democrats push back now against the attacks from uh, many in, in the Trump circle that this is somehow all caused by them and the accusation that Trump wants to be an autocrat if elected? What are the kinds of corollaries to our discussion on Friday that the shooting now brings up? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, of course, it's a reminder of how very quickly our politics can shift on a dime. There are some kind of seismic events that really have the possibility to sort of change the conversation completely. This obviously is one of those, and especially because of the timing of it, which occurs not only more than two weeks into this debilitating internal feud among the Democrats over the fitness, suitability, and political viability of their own candidate president, Joe Biden, but also on the eve of the Republican National Convention poised to nominate Donald Trump for a third consecutive presidential election cycle. It already was going to be a convention that was very much focused on Trump personally. Uh, that has been the reinvention of the party over the eight years of his escalating dominance of it. And, you know, he had already framed this 2024 election, it seems to me, very much in terms of uh, personal terms of revenge and retribution and even persecution and martyrdom. Well, of course, a tragic and traumatic event like this for him, as well as for his followers, is very likely to accentuate those themes. You saw that in the immediate aftermath of the shooting. Lots of talk of Trump as their, you know, Republican hero, their Republican martyr. You had senators like Marco Rubio tweeting about how Jesus and, you know, God saved Donald Trump. And so I think that's one obvious theme that is likely to be even more pronounced in the Republican convention. I think the images from Saturday in Pennsylvania, uh, that photograph in particular taken by the Associated Press chief Washington photographer, is going to be an indelible political image, one that we will be seeing forever. Indelible, right? It's now one of the 10 most indelible pictures of a president, I think, in, in American history now, right? It so plays into what you're talking about because now it looks as if there's something real to be vengeful and retributive about and, and his tremendous kind of visceral defiance is worth not a thousand words, but a billion words as it went multiplied in social media, right? Well, that's right. I mean, the rage is what came through to me even in the moment, the rage and the sheer hatred on his face. 
watching the video is equally transfixing in a horrible way when you see this awful thing happening to Trump that he collects himself for a moment and as his secret service is seeking to rush him off the stage he you know is audibly heard to say you know wait while he then makes that pose thrusts his fist into the air appears to say fight and then shouts USA and the crowd then joins him in that chant it is in other words a photograph that he even in this incredible moment of pain and shock and trauma and horror is able to collect himself for a second and he wants to have this pose. He wants this to be the message that he sent. To curate, right? Absolutely. Yeah. He, you know, and that that's just a remarkable thing. It's an amazing thing to watch that all unfold horrible. You know, and then there's the other point though, and this is a little bit different of a point. We don't know yet what it will mean, but the fury, rage, anger directed by Trump's followers and Republicans in the immediate aftermath of the shooting at Democrats, personally in some cases at Joe Biden. You had a congressman from Georgia accusing Joe Biden of somehow having been responsible for this horrific attack on Trump. This kind of visceral rage from Republicans is clearly one element of the political moment. And we'll see if it dissipates over time or whether it focuses and clarifies and consumes the race from their perspective. But of course, this is a very divided country and there's a different story immediately as well for the millions of non-Trump Americans who were horrified at the image of political violence against anyone of any political persuasion. It also is something that they're grappling with, I think, that here is this military-style weapon of war being used against the former president while his own party and the president himself have refused to ban such weapons. And we've had this plague of public shootings over recent years. And that, for Democrats, is the much more salient issue, this question of gun violence in America and what to do about it. And so, again, we're left, I think, with a divided country that will end up having very different stories that it tells itself about what just happened here, even though hopefully, and I, I do say hopefully, let's hope that most people can agree that this is horrible and outside the bounds of acceptable outcomes in a society, even one as divided as ours. By the way, on the gun point, I, Bethel Park is really an, a community in Pittsburgh, and it looks as, as if the father, who so far is only talking to law enforcement, it was actually his gun and legally acquired, but it, but there's so many resonant implications that will be worked out. But, uh, you know, here's a 53-year-old guy who happens to have an AR-15 at home. Okay, and again, so stipulating this is the least of it for now, and this is a week later down the line, to the extent this plays into this both iconic moment, the possible um, arming of Republicans to say that somehow it was all some combination of the Secret Service and the political opposition to Trump was responsible. You're now back to, in very short order, the crisis of who is the candidate atop the Democratic ticket. Is this an asterisk? There's nothing really to do about it? Or does it in any way play into the calculus, do you think? Yeah, it's, that's a really obviously important and timely question. I think it's still too early as we're having this conversation on Sunday evening. Some people are reporting that senior Democrats think it will uh, sort of end that conversation, that now is just not the time for more kind of instability and uncertainty in our politics, and that perhaps there's a, a rally around the flag, a fact that aids both former President Trump and incumbent President Joe Biden. I don't know. I mean, there was already sense that Biden, the longer he went on, he didn't resolve the concerns and complaints about him inside the Democratic Party, which in the end, right, are complaints that can't really be resolved because they're about his ability to get the job done, his ability to win, most of all. And that's the interesting thing. Republicans, many Republicans were instantly, instantly on Saturday looking at this horrible event and 
thinking this is it. We've galvanized, won right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, but I mean, not just galvanized. They were triumphal. There's a story in Politico. You can read some of these quotes for yourself. It's quite dramatic how you had elected Republican officials. Their own president has been spared just barely, right? You know, just to buy it an inch or two inches from being, you know, mortally wounded, perhaps. And they were instantly seeing that this was going to be a great benefit to them electorally. I don't know that that's the case, actually. And I found it interesting that they they thought that was the case. I think many Democrats probably had the same reaction of fear and dread that this somehow would spell the end of Biden's candidacy. I'm I'm kind of skeptical on both fronts. I think Biden has emerged wounded politically while Trump was wounded physically by this. But in this divided country, you see the kind of surprisingly minimal damage that Biden has sustained in the public polls, at least. It's real, but it's relatively minimal since the debate. And that's almost certainly a factor of his sort of age and capacity already being factored in by a large chunk of the electorate, which nonetheless has a ceiling for Donald Trump. It's hard for me to see that that ceiling for Trump is lifted by this particular event. But of course, it's how you handle a crisis that ultimately tends to shape the outcome of it and not just the crisis itself. So I don't think it's the fact of Trump being grazed by a bullet in his ear in an assassination attempt that inherently means one or the other political outcome. I I think the next week will sort of shape how that is. And so the fact of the timing then becomes everything with this Republican convention. I really think that's the bottom line. There's just, it's so volatile in the very short term. Thank you very much just for speculating about it. I'll, I'll end where I started, which is much of this, of course, is premature. And by the way, it seems like you could write a, a book about the last eight years that just is starts with this episode that encompasses kind of 18 different social, political, legal, personal, psychological issues about America in, uh, in in the Trump era. Thanks very much for the gloss on our episode, which starts now, and I hope we'll be, as the next days and week kind of emerge, um, able to talk more with you, Susan Glasser. Thank you so much, Harry, and let's hope that this uh, 1968 in uh, reruns is canceled quickly. Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. Saturday night's assassination attempt on Donald Trump, which took place after we taped this roundtable discussion, is one more convulsion for a political system shaken to its core and in which the basic social consensus seems to be coming undone. We append a discussion of the assassination at the top, but the focus of this episode is a political puzzle for the Democratic Party with immense consequences for not just the party, but the Democratic experiment. Many of the country's finest political minds have advanced a solution. The problem is they don't agree on what that solution should be leaving the nation and, in some ways, the world unsettled and holding its breath as to whom the Democratic Party should put forward as its standard bearer against Trump, whose prospects seem to nudge forward with every passing week of uncertainty. And the assassination attempt, which occurred Saturday night where I grew up and served as U.S. Attorney in Pittsburgh, only adds to the volatile and incendiary atmosphere. It also suggests a likely steeper uphill battle for the Democratic candidate, whoever that might be, to contend with. Should the Democratic candidate be President Joe Biden, the only politician ever to defeat Trump, who would be running on a record of economic success arguably unmatched in 50 years, even though he has been plagued by dismal approval ratings pre and post the catastrophic debate that raised doubts among even his staunchest supporters about his ability to win and govern over the next four years? Should it be Vice President Kamala Harris, whose substitution for Biden at the top of the ticket 
would bring several efficiencies, including the transfer of millions of dollars in donations the ticket has already received. Harris also possesses formidable retail political skills, but faces perceptions of a failed or ineffective vice presidency with overall approval ratings lower than those of the president. Or should it be a fresh face from the Democrats' relatively deep bench, such as Gretchen Whitmer, Josh Shapiro, or Wes Moore, who would need to emerge from the scrum and take their case to the country despite inevitable Republican demonization in just a few short months? And underlying all these questions is the procedural issue of how the party, known for its factionalism, can agree on a process and outcome that will allow the chosen candidate to enter the campaign with minimal baggage and maximum consensus. To analyze the state of play in as volatile and consequential political dynamic as the country has seen in many years, we welcome three of the country's most prominent and thoughtful commentators, and they are Susan Glasser, a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes the weekly column on life in Washington. She has written several books, including The Divider with Peter Baker, which we covered in a Talking Books episode. Thanks, as always, for joining, Susan. Great to be with you. Jason Kander, the host of the podcast, Majority 54, and the president of the National Expansion at Veterans Community Project, a nonprofit dedicated to fighting veteran suicide and homelessness. After himself serving in the Army in Afghanistan, Jason was elected to the Missouri State Legislature and later became Missouri Secretary of State in 2012. Thank you for your service, Jason Kander, and as always, for joining Talking Feds. Great to be back. And a first-time guest on Talking Feds, so we've spoken to him before on our one-on-one YouTube series, Mike Podhorzer is the former political director of the AFL-CIO. He's the founder now of the Analyst Institute, the Research Collaborative, and the Defend Democracy Project. His substack, Weekend Reading, is essential reading any day of the week. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. All right, let's go immediately to the issue that's monopolizing and convulsing the political landscape Where does the prospect of President Biden's potential stepping aside as a candidate stand after yesterday's hugely anticipated press conference? Well, here we are in week three of the Democrats' internal sort of circular firing squad that has taken place ever since the Biden debate that went very, very, very badly. And we're not closer to resolution, I would say. There's probably here in Washington a view that the longer he stays in and nothing happens, that inertia and time probably help the president. He's dug in his heels. It's the collective action problem. Who's really going to take it upon themselves to try to force him out? But at the same time, I haven't seen the kind of full-throated getting behind the president of the United States that you would see in really almost any other circumstance that I have encountered, including circumstances of presidents, both Democratic and Republican, having done very, very bad things <laughs> uh, and having their parties united against them. So I think it's remarkable. I think it's not quite over yet. And the outcome is very uncertain because Democrats have been amazingly united these last few years, it seems to me, largely because of the threat of Donald Trump. And that initially helped Joe Biden to win the presidency in 2024. And I think now that is is hindering his efforts to become the party's nominee for another term. That's what Democrats want more than they want Joe Biden is they don't want Donald Trump. That's absolutely correct. I think that Trump has concentrated Democratic lines for quite some time now and has enabled them to forestall a lot of Dems and disarray stories that used to be. <laughs> like the main, you know, thing that everyone went to write whenever they couldn't think of anything else. But I think that it has become a really complicated situation because of how long this is like that's happening so late. And I think what Susan said is exactly right, that no one is out there with a full throated defense because no one has confidence that he's not going to blunder again. And so they don't like want to be tracked 
as how they backed him in that context. And on the other hand, there's what you were saying before. It's a collective action problem, lots of reasons for inertia. And I think a kind of wishful thinking that like he'll just get through it. I have no firsthand information, but just from watching the way the Democratic leaders have reacted, I would infer that what they at least are telling themselves is that having not pulled the rug out from under him immediately, they have created space when he does do something the next time to go to him and say, you know, you said it was one off, we're with you then, but now this is just not tenable anymore. Whether they'll remember that the next time something happens or that they won't come up with a reason to say that the next thing isn't quite bad enough, right? I mean, there's limitless potential for rationalization. But at least I think it's a pretty fair guess that something like that's what's going on in their heads. Jason, you tweeted that his performance didn't remove all concern, but you feel somewhat reassured But does a good enough performance enable the campaign to live another day? You have, even after a pretty good performance, there were more naysayers coming in to say he should pull the plug and been a terrible week in terms of the money folks. Is there really anything to do that he can do to remove the doubts that seem to be abiding? I think that Anything that would remove doubt would, at this point, be outside of his control. It's going to be things like Trump making a massive mistake or something else happening that uh, really changes polling by at least four or five points. That's going to be the kind of thing that reassures people. And I, I don't know whether that's going to happen, but that's what it would take. Because, look, I think we should be honest. President Biden is an 81-year-old man. And what we saw in the press conference yesterday was an 81-year-old man who had really impressive command of the situation and really impressive ability to articulate his thoughts for an 81-year-old man. And it's not an indictment. That's just what it is. And, you know, look, I have been catching plenty of heat because I've been one of the people who has said, love Joe Biden, respect Joe Biden, feel like what Joe Biden has done in the last four years is for the most part very impressive. There's been things I disagreed with, but for the most part, as a Democrat, I'm very pleased. But I also think that the question in front of us is, who is the best person to prosecute the best case that we have, thanks to him, the best case that we have had in a presidential year since probably 1996? And it is hard for me to escape two notions. One notion is that we have a vice president who is a literal prosecutor, who I believe could energetically and effectively prosecute that case. And the second notion that I can't really get away from is that in an environment where every survey says that the vast majority of the voters who will decide the election, swing voters in swing states, are saying that they are dissatisfied with the two choices. And if that is the case, history be damned, it does make logical sense that the party that chooses to listen and therefore change their nominee is most likely to be the party that is seen by those voters as being in touch, listening, the most important thing you can be in politics. Now, all of that said, do I think at this point he's going to step aside? No, I do not think so. I said what I said over the last couple of weeks because I thought that it was important to voice this, to encourage him to consider what the options are. I think he has considered it. And whether I agree with it or not, I think he's made his decision. I don't think it's going to change. Personally, I'm ready to forge ahead. I do think that we can win with President Biden. Do I think we have an amazing chance? No, but that doesn't change whether I'm going to work hard and try and help make it happen. It's so interesting to hear a politician's perspective on this. First of all, I think it's really important to note that who is going to be in the best position to beat Donald Trump is often missing from too many of the public debates that I'm seeing unfold on television or social media. There's this sort of, I've seen it referred to as blue MAGA element, but, you know, encouraged and and baited and egged on by the Biden White House, which has been a fascinating element of this, this sort of hectoring, bullying, over-identification of person and party in that vain effort to save Joe Biden's political career 
what they've been doing is an extraordinary act of kind of the Trumpification of their defense of Joe Biden, right, to imply that you are not really acting in good faith if you criticize Joe Biden and that, you know, therefore you are pro-Trump, therefore you are against the party. Whereas what's so fascinating to me is I've talked with, as I'm sure everyone on this conversation has, with so many people, lifelong Democrats, why are they concerned? Why do they want to move on from Biden right now for the very pragmatic reason that they want to defeat Donald Trump? And that's what's so remarkable to me about the sort of parallel, sort of dishonest conversation, again, fan-fueled and flamed by the White House itself in Biden's own defense about, oh, no, you know, you if you don't defend Biden, you're against Democrats and you're actually in favor of Donald Trump. That's absurd, right? The motivations of the people that I've seen are to defeat Trump, number one. Number two, just thing I'm interested in hearing from everybody else in this conversation is this question of the parallel conversation, which is not just who can best defeat Donald Trump, but seeing what we're seeing here, there's also, I think, the real issue that's hardly aired at all, which is, is Biden fit to govern for four more years? And I suspect that the voting public has a strong conclusion that the answer is no, and that actually, far from elites being the ones who are hounding poor Joe Biden, man of the people out, that it's the elites who have, in some ways, refused to look at the evidence in front of their eyes because it it didn't suit the Democratic Party to have this big fight beforehand or because they were worried about Kamala Harris or whatever the reasons were. But um, I just feel like independent of the enormous threat that Trump poses to the country, I would like to look some of those people in the eye and say, can you really tell me that you truly believe that Joe Biden is in a position not where he is today at 81, but that you think honestly, looking at his trajectory the last few years, that at age 85, he's going to be a good president of the United States? And I I just, I'm not sure that anyone can honestly give me an answer of yes to that. Can I follow up on that and ask Mike, The question is basically, is that the question? In other words, that certainly makes sense. But you've always put the the news in terms of the very sort of narrow stratum of undecided voters. And and as you've put it, you know, what will the election actually be about by the time it comes to November? So, look, there's no way around it. Even at the press conference yesterday where he was basically in command of the facts, there were a few ways in which his age certainly came out. But Is that, in fact, what seems to be the decisive factor here? Or if you emphasize, as you always do, the the narrow band of people in play, what is really the important kind of decision or factor that in their heads? Yeah. And I don't want to lose the point, but I just want to agree with Susan about it being a completely legitimate question for everybody to be asking what kind of president would he be in that period of time. But to the more immediate, like, we have to win this campaign question. So I just want to be on record on that, that that's a real issue. For all of the strum and drum, I think the structure of this election really hasn't changed at all. That Before the debate, it was the case, as it's been in the last three elections, that, well, especially the last two, that when the election is about Trump and MAGA, when people believe that his or MAGA winning is going to lead to abortion bans or lose ACA, all of those kinds of things, they lose. If without risking triggering anyone to remember what we were all thinking in November 2016 after Trump won. And there was this sense that he'd blown through the blue wall, white non-college voters, Democrats were doomed forever, all of that catastrophizing. And in those five states, since then, there have been 27 statewide elections, and Trump or the MAGA statewide candidates have lost 23 of them. Right. When at that point, four of the five governors were Republicans. Now, four of the five governors are Democrats. They had trifectas in most of the states. Now it's just Georgia. They just keep losing there. Right. Because when the election's about, do you want them to run your state or country? They lose. 
It's also the case that in even the bluest of states, California, New Jersey, and New York, when MAGA is completely crowded out of the picture, you get what happened in 2022, which is you lose enough seats to lose the House of Representatives, right? Because if it's about non-MAGA issues, Democrat people just like don't like the way things are going. They stay home. They don't vote for it, right? It's a perfect natural experiment in kind of how this works, right? And it's very much keyed not to a question of just a two-way between the Democrat and Republican, but the third about whether you're going to go vote at all. Because these elections have been decided in those states in Democrats' favor in those races because a lot of young people, a lot of people who hadn't been voting, came out because of what they thought the stakes were. And turnout in those five states were as high as they were in an ahistorical record-breaking 2018, whereas in California, New Jersey, and New York, it was down by 6 to 11 points, depending on which state, right? Because grumpy people stay home, people who have lost aversion turn out. So if the election, which is why my confidence that if this is about Project 2025 and this is really going to happen to you, at some level, it almost doesn't matter who the Democratic candidate is. On the other hand, if that's not the case, if it's a referendum on any Democratic nominee, but especially Biden and how people think they've managed the country, Democrats are going to lose. And so the real question to sort of reformulate what you're asking is what's happened in the last couple of weeks made it more or less likely that the election is going to be about Trump or about Biden. And it's definitely been problematic because it's now harder to make it just about Trump. And anybody coming in leapfrogs that even if they're not a great candidate because they're not as clearly dangerous in the minds of a lot of people. And although there, it's not soon enough to see this reflected in polls, I would very much bet that if Biden stays in, we'll start seeing a new category of voters that I'll call the almost never Trumpers, right? The people who maybe by 2020 or 2022 were conservative, independent, regular voters in those five states who were just like, oh, this is like too much, right? And it wasn't embarrassing to vote for Biden then. It is now. It's a different context for those people. And the last three elections, those are being decided by a point one way or the other. This seems like a good segue, actually, to whether it matters and how it how it works if Biden steps aside. So, Jason, let me ask you, because you uh, you said if he does, the way forward is Kamala Harris. I wonder um, if everyone could speak to that, because taking up uh, Mike's point, I, you know, we've been looking at this very narrow stratum of what would you call a moderate conservatives in different states. But I think Harris changes the dynamic maybe in her selection, maybe makes for a bigger turnout, whereas her being passed over makes a lot of those people stay home. I mean, does it change the basic calculation that Mike and we are all talking about in terms of who decides this election? I absolutely agree with Mike that in many ways this election is, and I think I may have said it on this show before, that this is the closest we have ever been in a presidential election in my lifetime to that polling question, generic R versus generic D. It's the most polarized we've been in our lifetime. I think it is the reason why, no matter what's been in the news the last couple of weeks, you haven't seen that much movement in the polls. And so to me, it becomes, okay, if he were to step aside, What is the most seamless way to do that that introduces the least amount of potential chaos? I mean, what I am not interested in by any means is a debate over something like Gaza throughout the convention. I don't think that's good for the party. I don't think that would be helpful. And what I am interested in is if he were to step aside, what what I would be interested in is seeing a very capable vice president who is in the advantageous position to run on credibly the really impressive record of the administration. Combined with the fact that if he doesn't step aside, just as an aside, so to speak, if he weren't to step aside, I do think that the Trump campaign is going to spend the next few months running against Kamala Harris. 
there is an argument to be made that you are better off if the campaign is going to at least in part become a question of whether people want Kamala Harris to be the president, based on what Mike was saying earlier about people having doubts about President Biden being president for all four years. I'm not certifying or doing anything with those doubts. I'm just saying there are people who have those doubts. If you think that's going to be the question, it would make sense to let her lead the ticket. All I'm saying is, from a logistic standpoint, if he were to step aside, the money stays with her. You don't have to re-raise it. That's an important point. Can you explain that a little bit more about the money? Uh, well, the money was raised for the Biden-Harris campaign. If Harris is leading the ticket, you don't have to go re-raise the money. You don't have to do a bunch of stuff. You know, it, Logistically, it makes a lot of sense. And by the way, if he were to step aside, I think we would lean into the fact that for the last four years, she's been there. And I mean, look, there's nobody else in the party who has a better argument that they're ready to be president on day one, okay, than her. So that would be my feeling on it if he were to step aside. And Susan, they're trying to give her a sort of a second look. What is it that has made her pretty unpopular in the country? And is it sort of soft factors that can be overcome? Or is the die kind of cast for Kamala Harris at this point? Well, that's a great question. I think it depends on what your uh, diagnosis is about her unpopularity. Because if it is things about her political positioning or how she's performed as vice president or the overall record of the administration, those things can probably be addressed politically. If there's a certain bias factor against her because of how she presents and who she is, that's a lot harder to overcome. But to Jason's point, Biden's problem is that his singular liability is his age. And not only is that a chronic condition for him, it is a chronically worsening condition. And we are all watching that play out in real time. And I think that's Part of the unreality of some of the political conversations that Democrats are having, at least in public around Biden, is their squeamishness at addressing this. It's not like other kinds of political handicaps in the sense that it's not a communications problem that Joe Biden has primarily, although he does have one. It is an age problem that he has. I think that it wouldn't have become so salient and such a source of panic for Democrats if it hadn't manifested in the way that it's manifested, which is that the president of the United States at the moment is essentially taken off the board as a, an effective communicator. And this goes to, I think, these really fundamental questions that we're having at a shockingly late point in a presidential election cycle, right? In July, we're already in July, and we're having this debate about what's the narrative? What's the election about? What's it going to be about? Well, guess what? For all those people who are, I think, very generously grading Biden on a curve about that press conference last night. The bottom line is, what's one of the key early questions that he fumbled and stumbled over and had a hard time giving a good answer to? It's the question of, essentially, why are you running against Donald Trump? And um, he can't answer that in a compelling way. And what's really striking is that he couldn't answer that in a compelling way more than a year ago when he announced his reelection campaign. And it didn't probably get the attention that it should have at the time. I went back this week and rewatched the press conference that he gave the week that he announced his election bid. And he was asked a question at that time, the same question that he was asked this week. He was asked by ABC's Mary Bruce. Simple question, softball question for a politician. Why are you running again? And he gave a nearly 700 word answer that was word salad. It was like, well, I feel good. Uh, well, I want to finish the job. What job? This week when he was asked, what job are you want to finish here, sir? He, he started rambling on about trickle down economics and how when he was a senator, he really cared about this and stuff like that. That is not prosecuting an effective case, unfortunately, against Donald Trump. And so that's kind of a circular way of just getting back to your Kamala Harris question. But I think it's very relevant to Jason's point, which is she's got the liabilities of being in the Biden-Harris administration and the record, but she's not out there with the potential upside of being the candidate. And that seems to be where the center of this conversation has landed, that if it's not going to be Biden, it seems much more likely to me that it would be Harris, whereas in the immediate aftermath of the debate, People were all sorts of scenarios were kind of out there. And I, I now discount those scenarios. And I now think that if he steps aside or is pushed out, that she would be the nominee. I tend to very much agree with that. 
And I think one of the points that Jason made about having just the logistic advantage of having uh, campaigns money in the bank, this close to the election extends in a lot of other ways in the sense that you can't actually just stop being governor of a state and put together a billion dollar spend national campaign with people you trust that you've never even done a dry run for. And like things will go really wrong, right? It's really hard. I mean, it's unless you get to the point of actually thinking, okay, how would anyone other than Newsom, who does have sufficient national fundraising contacts and has been actively out there taking the case on this, I think it's not that realistic that there's another option this close. But I don't actually want to step into that conversation because I think. The answers that, you know, when people sit around talking about it, just can't know, is how the rest of the Democratic and anti-Trump community is going to react. And their unanimous support of anyone is more, and just we've got to get on with beating Trump, is more important than who it happens to be. And that's something I don't know. None of us really knows. Probably the people we're talking about mattering don't know themselves. Is that right in theory? So let's say there's a coalescence by the party elites and George Clooney or whatever. You know, you're talking about a number of people who this would might be their chance to be president and they'd be stepping aside for eight years or their whole uh, lifetime. Is there, if this general uh, sense that Susan and Mike are articulating actually seems to take hold. Is that good enough to make a fairly smooth transition to Kamala Harris, or is it likely to still be chaotic and hard fought? Do you see the Democrats sort of all getting behind somebody, including the candidates who it won't be? Yeah, I do. I mean, look, again, I don't think this is going to happen. But if it were to happen, if President Biden were to step aside I have to assume it would look like this. It would be President Biden standing up in front of the country and saying, I have listened to people. This is too important. I still think I can do the job, but I have to take seriously the fact that people have their doubts. I respect that. And so I won't be running for reelection. And then he would turn and he would say, my vice president will be leading the ticket. What that would be rightfully received as is one of the most patriotic things the country has ever seen a politician do. And out of respect for that, I cannot see anybody being in a position to go out and challenge that and have voters, including Democratic delegates, think that that was in any way acceptable for them to do that. Everyone's nodding. Is that that's say we all? It sounds like, yeah. I'd add another, like at the risk of adding some optimism here, I do think that it's worth remembering in early 2020 after... Biden had performed poorly in the first couple of outings and then was trounced by Sanders in the Nevada caucus that the same set of, quote, Democratic establishment elites managed almost overnight to get Bloomberg, Warren, Buttigieg, and basically everybody out of the primary and everybody agreeing that Biden was more important than Trump. And in that moment, Biden didn't become any better presidential candidate than he was the day before. And like the reasons people had reservations, if they did, then like didn't get cleared up by that. But the fact that all of those candidates said, nope, this is more important, you're all there, just like changed it overnight. Yeah, but they're doing what Biden doesn't seem to have the willingness to do. I mean, he part of the issue that I've seen that's made people so furious in the last few weeks. Again, I'm talking about Democrats. Supporters of Biden is his perceived choice of himself at the uh, potential expense of not just the party, but the country. And that's been reinforced, of course, by the insular nature of his decision making, the small inner circle, listening to Hunter Biden's counsel, bringing him into formal White House meetings. I have literally talked to people who are just incandescent with rage over the idea that Hunter Biden is being involved in making this decision rather than people who have a long record of not only running and winning campaigns, but a service to the country. 
And that, I think, is really upsetting people. Biden's original failed efforts at damage control were very revealing. When he spoke, he spoke about himself. And that answer was a just incredible answer that he gave to George Stephanopoulos when he said that essentially, I'll give it my all, as opposed to thinking about winning and losing in the existential terms he's framed it to the country. So I just think that's important to point out. But I actually had a question uh, for Mike that I'm very interested in the answer about uh, Kamala Harris, because you talked about potential emergence as this goes on, if Biden stays in, of what you might call the almost never Trumpers, but people for whom Biden has now been made unacceptable. And I have been doing some reporting around what you might call the the kind of the last remnants of the establishment Republicans, the country club Republicans, the Nikki Haley Republicans, whatever you want to call them. There were a large number of these people. Even in 2024, I was amazed to see how week after week in the Republican primaries, even after Nikki Haley dropped out, there were in the end millions of Republicans who could not stomach the thought of a vote for Donald Trump. And they voted for her even after she dropped out of the race. And so, like, what are those people going to do? I think that they are one of the reasons Joe Biden is president, right, that in the key states. And so my question is, what are those people going to do with Harris? Because I, I worry that they just lump her together. And I some of the big donor versions of those people that I've been speaking with definitely lump her together with Biden and definitely say, oh, no, she's not acceptable. And so they always are kind of moving the bar for Democrats, right, saying like, okay, well, we don't want Biden because he's not he's too old and that would be unpatriotic. Okay, well, we don't want Harris because she's a crazy California, you know, black liberal. Okay, well, they probably would come up with some excuse if it was Josh Shapiro or Gretchen Whitmer, too. But what do those people do with Harris and does it matter or do you just need a different coalition to win? Yeah, so that's a great question and also lets me make sure I was clear on the last thing I was saying about what happened in 2020. I meant that not to say that Biden won't do that, but to say that the rest of the Democratic establishment has demonstrated that if he does, it's not far-fetched to think that everybody falls in behind whatever it is the decision is, which gets to the question you're asking, which is that I think that it's easy to have an opinion right now, but once events happen, if it's a done deal just for the sake of this conversation for Harris, it's a lot easier to poke at it now than it is then. Now you're just sort of being a savant, then you're risking your career if she wins. And if he loses, she loses. There also even the risk of being seen as not having been loyal. So I think whatever people who are telling you that like may believe it sincerely, but I think if they actually get to the point where they pull off any substitution, really high probability people like that just fall in line. It's now time to take a moment for our sidebar feature, which explains some of the issues and topics that are prominent in the news. Today's sidebar explains the Comstock Act and what it has to do with abortion rights. And to explain this topic, we welcome Mian Christ. Mian Christ is a writer whose work has appeared in publications including the New York Times, the London Review of Books, The Atlantic, The Nation, Scientific American, and Science. She's the co-editor of What Future 2018, a founding member of New Right, and the host of Convergence, a show about the future. I give you me and Chris on the Comstock Act. The Comstock Act is an 1873 anti-vice law that, in its current form, bans the mailing of any obscene, lewd, lascivious, indecent, filthy, or vile article or thing, as well as anything designed, adapted, or intended for producing abortion. The original act, the first of its kind in the Western world, was drafted by devout Christian Anthony Comstock, a salesman who led the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. Congress has revised the act three times since it was first passed, including to eliminate the act's original prohibition on shipping birth control. None of the amendments, despite legislative efforts, has removed the act's reference to abortions. 
While modern federal enforcement efforts under the Act are primarily focused on prosecuting child pornography, the Act's reference to abortion has gained increased attention after the Supreme Court's 2022 decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. The Dobbs decision, of course, overturned Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood and with them, the constitutional right to abortion. After Dobbs, with various states severely restricting abortion access, so-called medication abortion regimens or abortion pills are a critical way to expand abortion access and overcome barriers to care. You may have heard of mefepristone and misoprostol, two medications approved by the FDA and endorsed by the World Health Organization to safely induce abortion up to 12 weeks of pregnancy. Anti-abortion advocates have argued that the Comstock Act bans the mailing of these medications directly to women and pregnant people. They've also argued that the act is broad enough to prohibit routine, general distribution of abortion medications and materials to physicians, hospitals, and pharmacies. During oral argument in the recent Supreme Court case involving the FDA's approval and regulation of mefepristone, Judges Alito and Thomas repeatedly raised the act, signaling they would be inclined to uphold its enforcement. That didn't happen because the Supreme Court held that the challengers lacked standing and dismissed the case, but that leaves the Alito-Thomas interpretation out there unsettled and likely to return to the federal courts. The Biden administration's Department of Justice rejects the Alito-Thomas position, reading the act instead as applying only where a sender intends that the drugs or materials be used, quote, unlawfully, in other words, for an illegal abortion because even the most restrictive states still allow for legal abortions in some circumstances, the administration has concluded it is impossible to determine a sender's intent. Because the Biden administration's interpretation is merely a matter of agency policy, not law, it is not binding on future administrations. And the Supreme Court's recent decision eliminating federal court deference to administrative agencies' interpretations of federal law further complicates the enforcement landscape. Finally, some states and some municipalities have enacted mirroring legislation, a.k.a. Little Comstock laws, which purport to apply to access to mefepristone by women in those states. Although a legislative change on the federal level is what's needed to remove the specter of Comstock Act enforcement, renewed efforts to repeal the Comstock Act's reference to abortion face long odds in the current Congress. For now, at least... The Supreme Court's dismissal of the case means that mefepristone can be distributed according to the FDA's determination. For Talking Feds, I'm Mian Christ. Thank you, Mian. Mian's nonfiction book about the climate crisis, Is It Okay to Have a Child?, is forthcoming from Random House. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we stir up a discussion around cocktails. Make your own or buy them ready to drink. There's no question that mixing a delicious cocktail is truly an art form. Precise measurements and proportions, creative substitutions, the presentation itself, and even the speed of delivery are all factors that earn great mixologists the reputations they deserve. But for people who may not stock things like triple sec and bitters, a ready-to-drink cocktail that's pre-measured and mixed just might be worth pulling off the shelf. Ready-to-drink cocktails don't necessarily give you the satisfaction of creating a drink from scratch, but they do offer up undeniable convenience, removing the complexity of recipes, the burden of acquiring ingredients, and the time it takes to measure, pour, mix, crush, stir, and of course, repeat. Plus, you still have the ability to customize your drink, adding a splash of this or that, here or there, to your liking. So whether you're into customization or convenience, ready-to-drink cocktails give you a little bit of both. Now, who says you can't have your cocktail and drink it too? So what's better, customization or convenience? Probably depends on the situation. It can be fun crafting your own cocktail. But when time is short, ready-to-drink cocktail sure does hit the spot. Either way, you can grab all the ingredients you need for a great craft cocktail or get your ready-to-go favorite at Total Wine & More. 
Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. Let's move for the, the balance of time to the other side. There's a supposition that Trump, it just doesn't matter what he does. He is now who he is. People will be against him or not. Does anyone disagree? Is he just a cartoon character? Or is there still ways that he can really affect his own standing significantly? Well, first of all, I would say that he is definitely being quiet right now, trying to keep things as they are. And the expertise I will lend to this is that I was running for Secretary of State in Missouri in 2012 when Todd Akin made the legitimate rape comments. And I've been in this position. I've been on the phone with Claire McCaskill when she was saying to me, hey, there's two more weeks before we're past the ballot printing deadline. None of us say a thing because the Republicans were trying to get them off. So I, I've seen this move. I've done it before. I know what it looks like. So I understand what, what they're doing over there. That aside, regardless of that, I don't think that there is anything that Trump is likely to say that any voter is going to go, you know, I don't think he's a good guy. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. That think, really crossed the line. <laughs> yeah. But what I do think is that when Trump says, I had no idea there was gambling in this Project 2025 establishment, I'm against it, but I know nothing about it. <laughs> um, you know, and when he does all that stuff, it's not about winning people over to his side. It is about handing people a permission slip. That's Trump's entire campaign. Trump's entire campaign is, I am a vile person. You would not want me to house sit for you. You would not certainly not want me to sell you a car. You would not want me to do any of those things. And honestly, you probably don't want me to run the country. But you and I, we hate the same people. So let me give you a permission slip occasionally to vote for me. So, oh, you're concerned about Roe v. Wade being overturned and you know that I'm responsible for it, but your neighbors are all voting for Trump because you live in an exurb and you would like to join your neighbors emotionally, psychologically, you'd like to. Well, let me say a few things that you can use to give yourself that permission slip. Or, hey, I spend every morning in a, in a spray-on tan booth and somebody paints my hair on and I don't walk outside without makeup. So let me give you the permission slip of me appearing a great deal younger than my opponent. Whatever it is, these are all permission slips. And I'm joking about them right now, but we, we cannot take them lightly. It's a very real thing. I really appreciate the permission slip framing there because I think that that captures so much along with another move in the Trump playbook that we've all seen so many times before is the like, who is this man? You know, I've never heard of him. Oh, wait, he's you know, worked for me for 20 years. No, I never heard of him. <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's very little connection to me. And he ran that play again and again. So now he's just doing that with a whole ideology, you know, that he's apparently unfamiliar with. And what's remarkable is that all of the footage of him saying again and again, and he usually says it at every single one of his rallies, that I got rid of Roe versus Wade. In Donald Trump's mind, there's no such thing as shame and being accused of hypocrisy. And so that kind of brazenness is also a superpower of his. So what we perceive to be gotcha, like, look at this. And and that's my one critique, just from a distance of the play that Democrats have been running this week on Project 2025 and the whole gotcha thing. Voters, I think that's a little bit too clever by half, honestly. You watch like CNN and MSNBC tripping over themselves to prove that all of Donald Trump's former advisors wrote this damn thing. You know, anyone who's undecided about Donald Trump at this moment in time is not going to be <laughs> consulting the nearly 1,000 page manual and blueprint for the ideological takeover and deconstruction of the administrative state that the Heritage Foundation has put together. The things that Donald Trump is for and that the Republican Party are for are crazy, extreme, radical, an anathema even to many of those people living in those excerpts in America's battleground states. They are incompatible with the view of the United States of America that those people have grown up with that they actually value, at least on some level. And I have been mystified. Again, I'm an observer, not a political operative. But it seems to me that it's a little bit of a mistake to be attacking Project 2025 instead of attacking 
the wild-eyed, radical, out-of-control, dangerous ideas espoused by Donald Trump and the party that he now leads as a cult of personality. But hey, that's just me. <laughs> well, I don't think it is just you. I think it's also Mike. And and Mike, I wanted to ask you to follow up on that, but factor in also some things you've said about the Supreme Court and the immunity opinion that how does Susan's point play into the broader agenda as it's been given a very big shot in the arm by the Supreme Court? Sure. So I want to offer a slightly different twist on everything's baked in on Trump and on his hypocrisy and then sort of go to what you're saying. I think that it's true that in his marquee personal uh, things people don't like about him, that that is baked in. But, you know, something like a minimum of seven, maybe as much as 10 or more percent of the people who are going to vote in November are so young that they either do not actually remember what it was like when he was governing before, even if they think he's the orange man or something like that, definitely do not see him as the threat they should. And so I think it's dangerous to think that because one aspect of Trump is pretty baked in, that the more important aspect of a second Trump administration is far from baked in. And when you look at every single survey, and the Times are the really high quality ones, almost all of the altitude loss Biden's had is among younger voters, people of color, folks who are not tuning in, people who have migrated to TikTok, other places. And they, hard as it is to believe, really don't know what we know about what Trump 2.0 is. And so that really is the mission. And on the Project 2025 stuff, I think the reason why it's important that they're actually doing that in July, that the media is doing it, is because if it's stipulated that all of those things are associated with that Trump 2.0, when we get to October, when people start tuning in, then that has made a pretty bulletproof foundation for being able to make claims that will seem radical at the time. Right. So I'm actually pleased to see the media understanding that he really can't walk away from it. That even though, like you say, the people who matter aren't paying attention now. To the court, the first five, now six appointees that were basically there to do the Federalist Society play of accomplishing the sort of plutocratic and theocratic agendas that could not possibly fly in Congress to do it through the courts. And that is exactly what they have succeeded in doing, right? Can you imagine the Republicans in Congress trying to pass Chevron as legislation, right? Like, we want to make sure that polluters can pollute more, right? It's just like, that's not the world we live in, right? And so their strategy is all of those things can be done with a pen if you have five votes on the Supreme Court. And if you were put in a sort of medically induced coma right after McCain's concession speech and woke up now and found out that now corporations give as much as they want, there's no barriers to gerrymandering, the Voting Right Act has been overturned. The Republicans tried to overthrow the election, and as a result, are now the majority party in the House of Representatives. We've gotten rid of Dobbs. We've gotten rid of environmental regulation. But what happened, right? And what happened is that we had a judicial coup in this country. And because of the nature of the coverage is each case, and like, why did they do that? But every piece of it was... The Federalist Society agenda as an outcome, every one of them, unlike previous blockbuster decisions, was straight 5-4 partisan, right? It used to be in those moments when the Supreme Court had to intervene to do something very disruptive, it was 9-0 or 8-1. 
And a lot of effort was put into making a consensus decision to see, like in Brown, to signal the country had to go there. This is just, we're here, we have the votes, this is our agenda that we're here to implement, and we're doing it. And unfortunately, they keep getting accorded the respectability of a court that's no longer really a court. And I think one of the things that scares me most about the next several months is they will continue to do everything they can to intervene in this election. And if they can do Bush v. Gore again, they're going to do Bush v. Gore again. And if we don't make clear to people what's actually going on, it'll be over before it starts. I think that Project 2025 is potentially one of the greatest unforced errors by a presidential campaign or by a political party in a presidential year in a very long time. And the reason I say that is because, as we've been discussing, this race is pretty static. As we talked about a few minutes ago, even with the craziness of the last couple of weeks on my side, the Democratic side of it, it remains pretty static. And the reason that that craziness has happened is because the new development, which is what changes the dynamics potentially of a static race, is that the narrative around Biden's age has been called into question, right? Well, the other side of that coin is that you have Trump, who, as Mike pointed out, has a lot of things going for him in terms of the fact that he gets a maddeningly free pass from the media. I mean, let's be real. Regardless of how well Biden fared in that press conference yesterday, Donald Trump could never do that. Okay, at at any age, at any point in his life, Donald Trump could never stand up there and seriously command an audience and talk about foreign policy with anything other than platitudes and without saying it's like nothing we've ever seen before 15 times. Okay, which, by the way, as an aside, the next time they debate, Joe Biden's first answer should involve him saying, let me tell you five phrases he's going to say over and over again. That's an aside. Um, But the new development is Project 2025. The first time I ever ran for office, I remember I sat down with a congressman uh, who had become a friend of mine in a rather random way from another state. And I was just about to launch my campaign for the state legislature. And I showed him this huge thing that my wife and I had written up that was going to be my issues page of my website, which in 2008, you had to have an issues page on your website. And he said to me, Jason, are you crazy? Don't write all this stuff down. Of course, I agree with everything you're saying here, but don't give your opponents the opportunity to pick it all apart. Give answers as as the questions come. And so what they have done is a bunch of self-important egghead jerks at the Heritage Foundation who feel like the world must be thirsty for their stuff that they have to say and for what they think have written down something and they have called it Project 2025. (laughs) And so while we're out there trying to tell everybody, look at what he's going to do with the court, look at what he's already done. And everybody goes, yeah, but a lot of that stuff's happened and my life hasn't, like, you know, I haven't driven off a cliff yet. But when you can take all of it and you can shorten it to Project 2025, it is rightfully ominous and scary and The thing about everybody knowing what they think about Trump is that they know he's a liar, even if they kind of like him or even if they hate the people he hates. So when he says, well, I don't have anything to do with that, they're not going to believe him, at least the persuadable voters. And I think that the one thing that does give me a a strong degree of optimism right now is I think we're going to hang it around his neck and I think it's going to be pretty heavy. So I just want to say that was a great and persuasive case there. And To be clear, I am totally in favor of journalistic enterprise around Project 2025. My point was just, I don't know what's more persuasive to this small number of people who are going to decide the outcome of this election. And having written a book about Donald Trump, I would also say that it's true that he's a liar, but it's also true that his staff often propounds policies and proposals that he doesn't necessarily agree with. And That's where his incredible stream of consciousness Twitter feed came in to understand, you know, which part of the Trump agenda is actually endorsed by Donald Trump, Russia being a great case of that, but not the only outlier. And that actually staff really matters an awful lot. Who is around Donald Trump matters to a huge degree if he returns to the White House because he's very ignorant and indifferent to the details of policy proposals. He has a strong kind of sense around a 
a relatively small handful of issues that matter to him, combined with whatever issue becomes front and center in the news, and that he's going to be right in the middle of that. But everything else, he's perfectly willing to outsource in a very transactional way to key parts of his constituency or to key individual members of his administration. And that's part of the reason, I think, that so many Republican insiders have made this deal with the devil with Trump is because they correctly believe that he can be managed, manipulated, whatever you want to call it, to carry out his agenda, even if he doesn't actually agree with large chunks of it. So I stipulate that this is hugely important. I'm just wondering, as a matter of politics, the extent to which it will be an effective argument with that small remaining number of swing voters in battleground states. I mean, it's a great case, and I definitely agree with the idea that this has been a static race and that there's been so little movement even around the question of Biden's age. It shows to me, I'm not usually always the optimist, but I guess we're closing this conversation. I'll close with a very optimistic little gloss, which is the last couple of weeks have reinforced for me the idea that I don't think there is a MAGA majority in America. I believe that there is, in fact, a strong majority in America that does not want Donald Trump to return to the White House. And that that includes a significant chunk of Republicans as well as conservative independents who don't want Donald Trump. And the problem is Biden's so hampered by the issue around his age and capacity for office that somehow that could be the outcome anyways. I don't know, but I do feel relatively confident and relatively convinced by recent events that people don't want Trump. He's not shot way up in the polls as a result of Biden stumbling. And that should tell us something, too. All right. So there's an end for now, unfortunately, but we'll bring it up. I just want to align it with what Mike said um, early on about, in a sense, this is what will the election be about come October? And that's a way to frame it. All right. Gosh, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. We just have a minute for our final Talking Five feature where we take a question from a listener and we all have to answer in five words or fewer. And today's question is, what's the best explanation or what explanation will be given by climate change deniers for the 120 degree uh, heat wave and weather in Las Vegas and elsewhere? What's their What's their response to the sweltering uh, heat across the country? It's uh, woke thermometers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I interpreted it in the exact opposite way, this assignment, because I, so I was going to say God's punishment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't you think it's hard with the amount of money the Adelsons give? <laughs> it's tricky, you know? I had, what about Hunter Biden's laptop? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a little bit on the Susan plan, which is um, prostitution and liberal abortion policy. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Mike, Susan, Jason. Hope to see you all back soon in this really, really, really pivotal, consequential time in uh, U.S. political history. Thank you so much, Susan, Jason, and Mike. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts, and please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry. As long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Catherine Devine, associate producer Gabriella Glick, sound engineering by Matt McArdle, Rosie Dawn Griffin, Hansa Mahendranathan, David Lieberman, and Emma Maynard are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Akshaj Turbailu and Anna Salvatore. Thanks very much to me and Chris for explaining the Comstock Act. Our music, as ever, is by the amazing Philip Glass. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.
Now it's time for a new section of the show, Talking Back. It's a special segment featuring a question of the week we've crowdsourced from our Patreon members. If you like the work we're doing at Talking Feds, joining our Patreon is the best way to support the show, and you'll have the chance to get your question answered on next week's show. Check out our Patreon link in the episode description. It only costs five bucks to join. This week's question is from Cynthia Montgomery. If Biden is elected, what abilities does he possess to shore up the presidency against a possible criminal presidency in the future? I'm just wondering what sort of avenues he might have. Thank you. Thanks for that, Cynthia. And the basic answer is not many. The Supreme Court immunity opinion bases its reasoning on constitutional principles and under our system since Marbury versus Madison in over 200 years ago, they are the final words on the Constitution. So you see different proposals now in Congress or you could imagine an executive order and really they don't do much to reverse things. So if he just tried to overrule the Supreme Court, it wouldn't go anywhere. There is one interesting possibility, however. So maybe the uh, play would be that he does a waiver and maybe the courts uphold it and then it would be a kind of cultural norm for presidents going forward that people would waive immunity as a way for individual presidents to keep the immunity principle from applying to themselves. Not clear it would work, but that's one thing that comes to mind as a possible pushback. Generally speaking, though, Supreme Court rules on the Constitution very little in terms of a response that the president or the Congress, for that matter, can do. Thanks for your question. 